Hi, welcome back to another edition of Inside Great Lakes Sailing. My name is Greg Norman, your host. Well, this is one of those rare occasions when you get to uh, enjoy the conversation. We talked this morning with Gary Jobson, who is a uh, author, sailor, TV commentator, Emmy winner, um, probably one of the best sailors America's ever produced. He's uh, had a chance to witness every America's Cup since 1962. He's won a couple of Emmys. He's been a tactician for Ted Turner in a couple of America Cup victories and won numerous championships. In fact, at the age of 69, he recently won an Etchell Championship, uh, North America Etchell Championships, uh, just this past, this past summer. So we're, we had a chance to talk with somebody with that background. And we're going to talk a little bit about Great Lakes sailing and a whole lot about sailing in general. Um, when you get a chance to meet one of your heroes, you take every opportunity. So up in a second will be uh, Gary, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the uh, third edition of Inside Great Lakes Sailing. When were you in San Diego? When did you live in San Diego? Well, I grew up in Barnegat Bay, New Jersey, but I lived in San Diego a couple times, three times during the America's Cup years, 1988, okay. 1992, and 1995. In 92, I was actually there from the fall of 1990 through the end of the cup in May of 1992. So I lived in Point Loma and uh, we had a kid in grade school and uh, it was a good experience. So that, that's where's my times living in San Diego. I worked for the San Diego Tribune for a long time. My only connection to San Diego history was that we was, I was part of a, a group that helped put together the uh, spinnaker that came out with the Surgeon General's warning when they had the charity race. <laughs> in right. Area. It was a suggestion made in the meeting I was in, and it was, uh, was kind of cool because as, as Dennis rounded the uh, mark with his uh, Marlboro, we put up the, the other spinnaker, and we got, there was a lot of press worldwide. But Oh, that was good. That was a good move. Let me, let me start from the beginning. You uh, started your career, in, you started your sailing career, obviously, in Toms River, New Jersey. Can you talk a little bit about what living in Seaside and Dad was a sailor? Maybe you can explain a little bit about that. Well, as a baby boomer, I grew up in Toms River, New Jersey, and sailed on Barnicut Bay, and I started sailing, believe it or not, at the age of six. That's when I joined the junior program. And I think the families that were having kids post-World War II were very engaged with their children at the time, and I was lucky to be one of them. And for me, sailing was a summertime activity, starting in Brams and then Penguins, very cool boat, and then eventually scows <clears throat> and then it went on from there and uh about the age of 12 i started sailing full-time year-round very unusual in the early 60s to be able to do <coughs> excuse me frostbiting in the winter so by the time i went off to new york maritime college i i had a pretty good basis and fundamentals in sailing and it was clear to me while growing up, that my life's mission would be in the sport of sailing. I'm not sure what twists and turns it would take at the time, but I knew that I was going to be a promoter of sailing from the age of 12. Do you remember and that moment? Do you remember that moment when it was the hook was there? Did, did you consciously remember? I can. So at the age of 12, this family came down to our little yacht club, Beachwood Yacht Club in New Jersey. And I, uh, I was cleaning my penguin up. And his family came over and started asking me questions. What is the sport and how do you do it? And I sat there uh, explaining how the sport was working and how to do it. I'm 12 years old. The next weekend, there they are taking sailing lessons. And so I thought, gee, I inspired this group to uh, sail, <coughs> and I've been doing it ever since. Obviously, on the college, you were an All-American. So at New York Maritime, I had a great coach, Graham Hall. I sailed in 2,000 races in that four-year career. 2,000. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about the cough. Not I ate a peanut earlier. So I averaged five ra 500 races a year, sailed the nationals every, every year, and I uh, was an All-American three times and twice, twice named college sail of the year. So I had a pretty good run in college. But I was a merchant officer, and I uh, made it – trip on the SS Newark sea land container ship but Vietnam was ending right at that time and shipping jobs were drying up fast so for almost no money I went to work at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy as a sailing coach and then uh, four years later the United States Naval Academy doubled my salary which was from nothing to <laughs> double nothing 
and uh, worked at the Naval Academy for a year coaching their sailing program. So I had a pretty good basis of teaching sailing and racing a lot, and uh, that launched me for quite a career after that. Where was the connection to big boats and maybe specifically Ted Turner? So I first met Ted Turner at the age of uh, 22 in 1972, and I'd sailed in a regatta in Barrington, Rhode Island called the Interclass Solo Championship. He sailed a different boat each day over three days. Uh, I ended up losing by one point to Robbie Doyle. He was an All-American at Harvard. And at the trophy ceremony, Ted Turner came along, and he put his arm around me and his arm around Doyle and said, I don't know who the hell you guys are, but we're going to sail together. <laughs> and uh, so after college, I started racing with Ted, and so did Robbie. And I, I did two America's Cups with Turner and the Fastnet and everything else that was Turner was doing. And that was a good run. And not only was the sailing good, but Turner said something to me right in the beginning. He said, look, it, you're going to help me sail better, and we're going to win some races, and I look forward to that. And in return – I'll help you with your business career. What do you want to do? Well, you know, I teach sailing and write books. He said, good. Well, he became quite the advisor to me, which led eventually to ESPN, my long career there, and all the media that I've done over the years. So have an advisor, the creator of CNN, Ted Turner, helping me with that, sure paid off. Step up, to say the least. Yes, sir. Is he a genius? Ted Turner is a genius. And uh, what makes him so good is he has the ability to recruit good people. He's incredibly people loyal to the people he works with. And he's got wild ambitions, but he makes those vision, visions become a reality. And that's really the genius of Ted Turner, to make things work. To figure out how to take a television signal, put it up on a satellite, blanket in North America, and uh, coming up with the idea of, well, people want to see news, I'll do 24 hours a day. People like watching movies, I'm going to buy movie studios. Well, people like watching sports, there's not many teams around Atlanta, I'll get the Atlanta Braves. And he actually pulled it off. And, you know, I, I can remember him telling me, Jobson, I'm going to be a billionaire someday. And, you know, I think they're, okay, well, let's get the jib loaded on board. And, well, he did. And he had a dramatic influence in the world with CNN and all the other things he's done. Was he a sailor because he was rich or because he was a sailor who became rich? No, he was a sailor who became rich. Ted, uh, he grew up with it. His father was in the outdoor advertising business. His father actually took his life when Ted was in college. And I think the father, I believe, was 52 years old, not so old. Okay. And uh, so Ted took over the company. He Somebody wanted to buy it for 90000 He turned it down. And so – he launched his career from there. And I've often asked Ted, I said, you know, did sailing help your business career or did your business and career help your sailing? And, and he'll say, well, I think the sailing helped me a lot. And probably the defining moment for Turner was winning that America's Cup. When he went from the seller aboard Mariner in 74 and won the Cup in 77, I think that gave him a lot of confidence that he could launch things in a big way. And three years later, he launched CNN. And in between, he bought the MGM Studio Library. You know, looking back, 3,500 films, that's a lot of content that you can put on television, and he owned it. I know that at that some point when you're sailing, you wanted a second career, obviously broadcasting, obviously writing, those kinds of things. He was instrumental in that, in that process. Uh, did you ever think that ESPN would be a part of that uh, in those days, it wasn't the fledging – it was a fledging process in, in, in those terms instead of what it is now. But uh, do, you, do you see it as a sailing career and then a, and a, and a broadcast career separately? Uh, it is. I've really had three careers. Two of them you know about and one of them you don't, which I'll tell you. One is in the media. One is sailing. And the third one is in healthcare. I've, I've done a lot in the healthcare space, uh, which I'll describe here in a minute. But the sailing – and the media tied hand to hand. You know, I had some expertise in sailing. Remember, I was teaching sailing and writing about it, doing sailing clinics and seminars for years before I got to ESPN. So that allowed me to be able to describe very complex things in sailing in a simple way to our audiences, and that really worked. And then from there, 
well, what else can I do? So I started producing documentaries. And when you're a television commentator, you're really a writer. And I had been writing for magazines long before ESPN. And my 20th book came out a couple weeks ago. I'm pretty excited about Legends of American Sailing. And I probably have over a 1,000 articles. And I know at ESPN, I have credits on 1,200 television shows. So that's a lot of media. Uh, is, is the Sable Island, was that, was that a sort of a pinnacle of what you've done? Sable Island was kind of a hobby project for me. I'd been to Antarctica a couple times. I've been to Spitsbergen up in the north and across the ocean, Atlantic six times. And I've done documentaries on just about everything. But Sable Island was this mysterious place off Nova Scotia where 350 shipwrecks. So I put together a crew. I funded it myself. I had no uh, sponsors or anything and put together my documentary, The Magic and Mystery of Sable Island. It's a miracle the thing actually exists. And with the rising oceans, it's probably going to disappear sometime in the next 50 to 100 years. To point out the Sable Islands, just south of Nova Scotia, a couple hundred miles? Yeah, it's 180 miles south of uh, Halifax, but it, it's a mysterious place. It's only about 100 feet high. It's all sand. That's it. Foggy. It is the foggiest place in Canada. Sable, by the word, is a French word that means sand. And the shipwrecks coming across the ocean couldn't see it in the fog, and that's why they ran up on it. In 1802, the Canadians created a, uh, a life-saving station and started rescuing people when they came ashore. Of course, then they wanted to own the cargo, so they saved lives and uh, acquired all the cargo. And uh, it's got an infamous reputation. Nobody really goes there. It took me two years to get permission to actually land on the island, but I took a couple archaeologists and a camera crew, and off we went. What's more rewarding, an America's Cup victory or an Emmy? <laughs> well, for a sailor, the America's Cup is the top of this sport and pretty special. And I knew sailing in that day that life would be different after that moment. I do have a couple Emmys on my shelf over here. And uh, when you win an Emmy in television, it's, it's a nice reward because you've been recognized by your peers at doing something special. My Emmys came from the Olympic Games and the uh, Volvo Ocean Race. We um, are very involved in the Leukemia Cup at Crescent Sail Yacht Club here in Detroit, out at actually Gross Point. I know you're involved in it uh, dramatically, so maybe talk a little bit about Leukemia's Cup, and maybe you can talk a little bit about your background or what or in, your involvement with uh, health. In 1994, I was at a meeting at ESPN and a bunch of producers and commentators, and the president gave a talk, and he said, you know, you're all very visible people, and you really should be involved in some kind of charity uh, to help the community at large. So tell me what charities you're involved in. And I put my hand up and said, well, I help junior sailors. And he said, well, that's nice, but you need to do something larger uh, for society. And a week later, I got a phone call. Hey, we're going to have a regatta here in Annapolis and try and raise money for leukemia. And maybe you'd like to be our spokesman. Well, I didn't even know what leukemia was. So I went to this press conference. There were seven people on the committee and one writer and that was the press conference. One writer, seven people on the committee, and uh, I, I was the spokesman for it. But the darndest thing happened. We had 100 boats sailing the regatta, and at the end of the weekend, we could write a check to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society for, for $30,000. Pretty good. 1994. So Braino here, very dangerous to make a suggestion at a volunteer meeting. I put my hand up and said at a post-meeting, you know, they're sailing all over the United States. We could do lots of these leukemia cups. I was told, what a great idea. Why don't you be our chairman? <laughs> I took a deep breath, but I had the ESPN in my head. All right, I'll do it for two years. Well, that two years stretched to 25 years. And during that process, we raised well over $60 million. And the ironic twist of fate for me was 10 years later. So. 19, uh, 2003, 10 years later, I got diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, one of these blood cancers myself. So in the end, I ended up being the recipient of all the money that we put into research so that I could be here talking with you today. Well, you got the diagnosis. I know you've been 
quoted as saying it was maybe the hardest thing you had ever faced. And mostly telling your family was the hardest thing you'd ever faced. Just sort of like a hammer dropping on you. You'd mentioned that in a couple of interviews. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I knew I wasn't feeling well. And I went through test after test after test. And finally I go see the big doctor. And he's really solemn. And he's sitting there and he says, uh, Mr. Jobson. I'm thinking, oh, my God, it's not Gary. It's Mr. Jobson. We have to report that you uh, have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And we're going to have some serious treatments. And I remember saying, well, Doc, I, I have uh, five lectures in California next week. And he said, you're not going to travel next week, and you're not going to travel for the next six months. In fact, if we can help you here in the next 30 days, uh, we'll get you through that, and then you might have a life expectancy of uh, five to 15 years. And that hit me like a ton of bricks, and I could feel this tear kind of coming down my eye. And the only thing that could come out of my mouth is, you know, Doc, I don't know what's worse, me hearing this news or you having to tell me. And he said, oh, I appreciate that. And it, it was a two-year battle. Uh, I, I went through rounds of chemo, and I got well for about a month. And then I came back with a vengeance, and I did uh, two bone marrow transplants. Uh, the first one I was in a kind of like a – incubator room with double doors for 23 days and and then I came back again and I went through the whole procedure a little less time but uh, it, it was dramatic but look that was uh, 2003 and 2004 and it's 2019 so I passed the 15 year mark and the doctor now tells me well you're gonna die but it's not gonna be that <laughs> so uh, we're all gonna die but uh, they, they, they did really well to come up with the procedures and the procedures I went through at that time were new so they didn't know survival rates but they now know that they can do a good job with people having these blood cancers. Did you learn anything from that experience? I learned a lot from it. I learned that uh, internal strength means a lot. I learned to uh, listen carefully to people that give good advice I learned how not to give in. Sailing helped me with that. You know, it's like a long beat up to Mackinac Island. You know, in the back of your mind, you're going to get there, but it's a long process uh, getting there. And then post-treatments, I learned to spend time with others. And every week, I spend time with two or three people, giving them advice on how to treat it. And, and then you don't hear from people and months later, oh, you know, your advice was so helpful. Thank you, Rods. You're the only one that told me the truth. How unpleasant the whole thing's going to be. I think, I think the lesson that I tell people is when you go through these treatments, there's highs and lows. There's good days and bad days. So when you get a bad day, don't get too upset. And if there's a really good day, don't get too excited either. You just kind of flatten out that curve so that you're not getting emotionally up and down. But you're just, it's your job. Just be steady. And work at it. You mentioned Mackinac. How much Great Lakes sailing have you done? So I've done uh, five Chicago Max, and I've done uh, three Bayview Max over the years. Great race. Love the fresh water. I've been out there drifting, swatting flies, and I've been out there <laughs> blasting at 35 to 40 knots and endured some <coughs> thunderstorms. And it's a nice reward when you finally get up to that island there, uh, the pink pony and all. So I, I've done that, and I've raced nude regattas and all kinds of things all over the lakes over the years. Any huge thoughts on the Great Lakes versus Ocean Sound? Well, the fresh water is nice. Uh, I appreciate that. And there's kind of an enthusiasm around the lakes that you often don't see in different parts of the world. I mean, the parade... Uh, in Port Huron, going out to the starting line, thousands of people. And you know, most of them probably never been on a sailboat, but they're just watching the parade go out. It, it's pretty special. And the transition, uh, when you start off Chicago in the waterfront, you're in a big city, and that city disappears pretty quickly over the horizon, and you're in the middle of nowhere, and often you're along the shoreline seeing those big sand dunes along the way. Now, I think the lakes are pretty special. And the weather's kind of fascinating, too. You know, I, I laughingly say it's often all or nothing when you're on the lakes and you get on Superior. 
there's not enough clothing to wear when you're up there sailing. Even in August, it's cold yeah. up on, on Lake Superior. One of our members won the Trans Superior single-handed earlier, John Walton, and we just oh talked, my god, if we just uh, we just talked about uh, leukemia. If I don't mention Mike Williams, Mike Williams has done a lot through our club through leukemia. He's raised a ton of money, and, and it, he sort of single-handedly puts this uh, event together. So I wanted to mention his name with in this interview so he can pat him on the back a little bit. But John won yeah. the Trans Superior race, which is a kind of a big deal. Uh, big deal. And that's a, that's a huge race. Well, it's a long way. It's cold. The weather's tough. And uh, if you can win that one, you've, you've achieved something. That's a good one to notch on his belt. <laughs> Well, the upside to it is I'm looking out my window at the moment, and we're going to get five or six inches of snow, and I literally put my boat away a week from a week ago Sunday. So I still had sails up a week ago Sunday, and, and we're, we literally – I'm a ski coach in the wintertime. We can be skiing probably within the next week, so it's, a, it's been kind of a fun – Well, you, you, got, you, you, you extended the season pretty long. You're probably lucky that it's all put away with the weather coming now. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the America's Cup, and then I wanted to eventually talk a little bit about Junior Sailing, but maybe with the, with the America's Cup coming up, uh, maybe you can send some light on it, maybe some thoughts. So I've been involved with the America's Cup for a long time, and I've been to every cup, everyone, since 1962. Since I was 12 years old, I've seen every cup in person. And I've sailed on five teams, and I've covered nine for television, and I've been a spectator. So I look at the America's Cup with wide eyes. And I'm never surprised by the craziness that goes on with the Cup. But I must say, this next Cup is uh, different than anything that we will have ever seen. Foiling monoholes, it can go 45, maybe up to 50 knots, we'll see. Emotionally charged teams, uh, well-funded teams, that's for sure, at least four of them. And uh, it's unclear who's going to win. I do have a favorite. I like to see New York win and return the America's Cup to Newport, Rhode Island. That would be a happy day. I was there when it was lost, and I'd be happy to get there. Your but having said that, it's going to be hard for them to win. I'm, I, I think they are going to be fine in the challenger trials. I, I think they'll beat Great Britain, and I think they'll beat the Italians too. But beating New Zealand and their home waters, based on what I saw, how strong they were in Bermuda, that's going to be a tall task. Should it be the technological revolution that the America's Cup is? Do you like that aspect of it? It really didn't change until the until Connor ran the, the, the you know the catamaran against the uh, against phase boat, and it, that was the first time it had changed from twelve meters. So there's two ways to look at it. The America's Cup has always been a technological war. You know, aluminum deck on a bronze hole in 1895, and they didn't know about electrolysis, you know. And there's a lot of innovations that have uh, helped the sport of sailing. Having said that, there's also an elegance to sailing, the elegance of match racing at the start or sustained tacting duels or sustained jiving duels. And that is going to be missed in this next cup. So the question is, how far do we want to go in the direction of technology? And how far do we want to go where the sailor makes a difference? Being a tactician, <clears throat> I always like the sailor making the difference. So I think the pendulum should swing back more to the sailor and away from the technology. But the way this, uh, the New Zealanders have set this up, it's going to be a technological battle. And if New York wins it, I hope they do a couple things. One, all national crews not on the international crew, all Americans on the American boat, Yes. all New Zealanders on the New Zealand boat, all the French on the French boat. Number two, they need to just go to some big, fast monohull where you get that elegance of sailing that people can relate to. Uh, and the people paying the bills, the owners of these boats, need to be on the boat. You know, Vanderbilt sailed on his boat. Ted Turner sailed on his boat. And now they have these boats where the owners can't sail on them. I think the owners should be a part of it. If you did those three things, you'd have a dozen or more challengers. And the other thing is we haven't seen a defense trials since San Diego in 1995. And really the America's Cup needs to be a two-ring circus. And the reason the United States was so strong for so long is they had multiple boats in the defense trials. The winner would come out of that and be well prepared for the challenger. 
does sailing lose something when you start to go into the spaceship type sailboats? I think it does. And here's why. If I go shoot hoops with the kids down the street here, as best as I can with all these 18 year olds, the basket's 10 feet high and it's 15 feet from the foul line to the basket. Right. LeBron James plays on exactly the same dimensions. Right. I got to see Roger Federer play this summer. I did. I was at midcourt at the U.S. Open, and Federer was playing. There, no, he's an amazing athlete. The net is exactly the same for anybody who plays tennis. The court's exactly the same. Here, this America's Cup has changed the game. It's changed the sport. So those of us that race in the Mac race or I, I race my Etchels, it doesn't equate to what we do. It, it's changed the sport. So that's why – you know, I think the America's Cup should have a big boat, but it needs to be a boat that everybody can relate to and be part of the sport as it's played by most people. My standard line is if you're wearing a helmet, you're not sailing. <laughs> it just doesn't, doesn't say, make sense to me. You know, I, I went sailing on uh, Oracle out in San Francisco, and the first words I was told when I showed up to go sailing, pay attention to the safety lesson. I had to take a 30-minute sailing lesson, learn how to use the oxygen tank, and the helmet, and the flat jacket, and the special boots. You know, I was like, holy cow, I'm used to foul weather gear. I do wear a life jacket when I go sail. And no problem there, but oxygen tank and helmets. And, I don't know, I thought I was in a space shuttle or something. You do a little more cruising now than racing by design. I do. I uh, started cruising in my mid-40s and found that's pretty good, too. Uh, there's no when you put the motor on. <laughs> what boat? You have a beer, you have a beer. We don't do that stuff when they're racing. But the, 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 there's two parts to cruising. One is to go to remote regions of the world, and I've done that, and see things that you don't normally see. And when you go by sailboat, not a cruise ship, but a sailboat, you see things in more of a distinct way. And then two are the people that you go cruising with, and you get to know people pretty well when you go on a six-week expedition to Antarctica or you go around Cape Horn or you sail out to Sable Island and you tend to talk about things that maybe you never talk about on land or because you're all experiencing something special. And then at the end of that cruise, you have a special bond. And 15 years later, you know, I'll bump into Skip Novak, one of my heroes from Chicago. And I've been to Antarctica with a couple times. You know, you share that experience with him. It's pretty cool. Do you what, what is your boat right now? What do you own right now? So right now I have a Hood 32. It's a beautiful classic boat, but it's got a modern keel. I'm going to show you a picture of it, and uh, it's got an electric motor, environmentally uh, okay. conscious here. And let me just pull up a picture and I'll show you what my boat looks like. Hold on, photos. Ah. Is this a, a boat one can buy, or is this a boat designed for Yeah, people? no, it, you, you, it, you can uh, buy it. I, I had it built. I'm just trying to. <laughs> and then the follow-up question is, what's the most fun 
what's the most fun you've had on a boat? Which, what, if you had to pick one boat in your career to to sail or to cruise, what would it, what boat have you had the most fun on? Hey, scouts. Okay. Hey, scouts. They're unbelievably fast. You know, you put seven or six six or seven people up on the side, and uh, they they really rock it. So I'm a big fan of scows, e-scows or a-scows um, are pretty special boats. Okay, I'm, I'm finding my boat. Here's a, here's a picture of it. Okay. Get it up close here. Oh, wow. I got a masted asymmetrical spinnaker. Notice that I launch it off the bow. Right. That's sailing by the U.S. Naval Academy there in Annapolis. And the thing really flies downwind. It, 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 it's a rocket ship. Um, and it sails nicely upwind. And, like here, here's another picture with a okay yeah. going cool. up with self tacking jib. I take my uh, grandkids out on it. There's some of my grandkids there. Look at that. <laughs> Are they waiting for me to go for a sail? Right? Where's Grandpa? <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the boat I have. I had a Swan Forty Two for a while, and a Saber Four Hundred Two, and Etchels and Lasers, and before the twenty thirteen. Cup, I jettison my fleet and have my day sailor. This summer, I, I sailed a lot this year, 2019. I did nine 12 meter regattas this year, two aboard Weatherly and nine, uh, seven aboard Courageous, nine all together, two on Weatherly. And uh, it reminded me how special 12 meters are. You know, we had, we, had, we had 22 12 meters racing in Newport, Rhode Island this summer, 22. Yeah. Crescent, where we belong, is a sail-only club. There's no power boats, obviously. And it's, yeah, it's a great club. I've been there a few times. It's a wonderful facility. You started. Uh, you spent some time as a junior sailing coach. As a junior, you were also a junior sailor. I did. We seem to be in the sort of the doldrums. I'm new to junior sailor racing. I'm a college coach, but they asked me to come aboard because I've got some expertise with kids, and we're trying to build some programs and get some ideas. One of the things I noticed this summer that we're changing for next year is that we have kids. We spend more time racing than practicing and more time practice, not enough time just being in the boat to enjoy themselves. They got to have a, so maybe talk a little bit about what you see in junior sailing and, and, and how do we get to do a better job with these kids? So one of my criticisms of junior sailing at the present time is that we push too hard on the racing and with all due respects, the coaches too much coaching, you know, it's thank you coaches setting up the boats and kids need to do it on their own. And as I look back on my days as a teenager on Barnicut Bay, I used to go day sailing all the time, just me or go out with a crew and a penguin. And I used to love sailing a long distance. You know, I, I kind of smile long distance, probably went eight miles or something. But that was a long distance right. when you're 15 years old and going out in Barnicut Bay with just the two of you. And my father said, well, make sure you wear a life jacket or not have fun. And, uh, you know, kids need to just go out and enjoy it and sail around. and. And play. I think, and then I, think Sandlot, I think it's Sandlot baseball. We don't do enough of that. You kid can't go out in the boat without having somebody over overseeing them. I'm not suggesting you don't put safety issues so they're all safe, and especially on the optimist side. But the kids don't get enough time in the boat by themselves to just do that Sandlot like we did as kid in other sports. By yourselves or, or with one or two other kids in the boat where they're just out, you yeah. know, and it's okay to go for a swim or uh, – I always like to pull up on the beach and just sit there and look out. And, uh, and I've, I've been doing that my whole life, even with all the America's Cup and Olympic classes and all the stuff I've done. Just going out for a sail is just one of the great joys in life. And we, we need kids to do that, go from here to there, out to the island and come back again and sail in company. It, it just relaxes you. Don't push too hard on racing. But when you race, race really hard, but do both of it. We try to point out to some of them here is that the U.S. National Ski Team uh, five years ago used to spend 60% of their time free skiing, 40% of their time actually practicing and racing. And that's actually up now, 75% time free skiing because what you find is that the kids go out and push themselves into things you're working on anyway because they want to make sure that they get better on whatever that technique might be. And I think that that has to happen in a lot of cases. You know, one of the things I say to kids when I speak to juniors in the sailing programs is, be sure to play some other sport other than sailing. Uh -huh. Roger Federer was a, actually apparently a very good soccer player. And his parents said, you're not just going to play tennis, you're going to play something else. And I, I played some basketball, and I also wrestled in high school. And the wrestling really helped my sailing career. 
one-on-one -on -one match racing. You got to be in good shape. It's all practice and preparation, strategic moves. I mean, wrestling is a really clean sport. There's a ref right there, and you're matched up against some of your own size. It's very strategic, and of course, you got to be in good physical condition. All those things apply to the sport of sailing. If you were describing this to a Martian, what would you talk to them about sailing? What is it that you love so much about the sport? Not all of all the experiences you've had. What's the one line that, that, that in your soul that, that you could say to somebody that didn't know anything about the sport? Sailing's a sport that gives you freedom. The freedom to be away from the land, the freedom to go wherever you want, to share the same passion of people that feel the same way. And when you're on a sailboat, whether you're racing, day sailing, or cruising, every 10 minutes it's different. The sun changes, the sky changes, the water changes, the surroundings changes, birds fly past, there's other boats going by. And so you just kind of have this slow-moving, evolving experience when you're in a sailboat that you just don't really get anywhere else. And, and most two things. One, you get to do it your whole life. You know, I, I played basketball. Believe it or not, I was on a basketball team with my college team. I got in every time we were up by 20 or down by 20. That's how much I played, up, up, or, up or down. Did you but learn something I don't really play basketball formally after, you know, in college I did, but after that I didn't. Sailing, you know, I'm 69 years old. I did the 12-meter Worlds this summer. We won the 12-meter North Americans and Opera House Cup. Uh, you know, so you can do it your whole lot, age. The second thing sailing does, which is probably the most important at all, I don't know of any other sport that connects the generations as well as the sport of sailing. When you think about it, in your life, you get to know your parents, your grandparents, your siblings, and your peers, and your kids, and I'm learning now the grandkids. That's five generations, and you can always do it on a sailboat. No, not too many other sports can you do something like that, experience it together with, across five generations. You mentioned that you sat on the bench as a basketball player in college. Yeah, I did. Now, you obviously are one of the most prolific sailors in American history, and you were a sort of a bench rider in basketball. Did you learn something from that? I did. That's a good question. Thank you very much. You learn a little humility. You keep trying as hard as you possibly can so the coach recognizes that you're at practice on time and giving your full effort and trying. And I, I got a, One of the kids on our team actually was really good at basketball. And in our yearbook, uh, he wrote the nicest thing. He said, if everybody worked as hard in practice as you did, we would have been all we're, we're being champions. You know, and that, that was really good. Although I, I do joke that I was the only All-American on that basketball team. <laughs> All-American sailing, not in basketball. Right. But no, it helped me out. And uh, the team aspect is so important. And uh, while you might not be on the court, other than the two or three minutes I got in each game, but you're very much part of it in the practice. And, uh, you know, you take the role of the other team. So you always felt a little pride that you help your team get ready when you won the game. You were part of it. Well, listen, I appreciate so much. You, you, you're, let me just to plug real quick, your, your recent book was, maybe just mention it. Sure. So it's uh, Legends of American Sailing. I wrote about 50 of the great sailors in this country. It's a new book. And uh, every single dollar, all of it, goes to benefit the National Sailing Hall of Fame. And I can tell you that from reading a number of your books, uh, especially American Sailing Journey, uh, yeah. that – was um, very heartfelt, and I've shared that book with a lot of people. Oh, thank you. And it's, thank uh, you. it's something. We appreciate your time, your efforts. Certainly, you've meant a lot of things to sailing. And to spend some time with us, we're trying to help build some junior sailing programs. So let me just say thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Nice to talk to you. Okay, great. Thank talk you. To you later.